on theoretically you are very experienced but practically you don't have any right risk taking experience or you are not on the field and hi everybody welcome to another episode of hello haymarket my name is daniel nice i'm your host and today i brought in a good friend of mine dk and we're going to be talking today about the intersection of entrepreneurship and real estate, right? As you know, this is a podcast about building wealth through real estate. And a lot of the times when I'm meeting with someone, uh, they don't, you know, they have a misconception about what real estate does for you. They think it's a get rich quick scheme and they can just invest when they have either no assets or no income. How are you going to do that, right? And so for those people, I often tell them, hey, look, it might not be right for you, but you should consider whether or not you want to have a job in this industry, right? I came from a different industry into being a realtor. DK came from a different industry. Matter of fact, DK, let's actually get into a little bit of your background here. Can you just kind of introduce yourself and kind of maybe give a little bit of your story, where you came from and how you got into real estate? Hello, everyone. My name is DK Divas Karka, and I am a new agent here in Kaza Group. I, the journey for me about the entrepreneurship started when I came to the U.S. in 2007, and I I didn't have a college degree because I came after my high school. And I used to work in a convenience store and find different particular odd jobs to fulfill my needs. And slowly I realized that over here in the US, you have so many offerings, so many opportunities here you can explore. Slowly I was getting my feet wet and exploring, I started, you know, working really hard and started going to school. And uh, for some reason, I really liked healthcare because in healthcare, I thought it is something everybody can do something in healthcare. So, I went to school for healthcare administration. I did my bachelor's, I did my master's. I went to work for um, a hospital in Wisconsin. Medical College of Wisconsin, and I worked under the Department of um, Pharmacy with the Director of Pharmacy over there. He's a very nice guy, and I recently followed him in LinkedIn. His name is Phil Bromont. And from there, I realized the corporate job is really not for me. On the side, I was working, trying to find, exploring the internet, and suddenly I came across Amazon FBA, which is pretty cool, and I started finding niche to a product and suddenly one day I realized I could sell a lens cover in Amazon. So I you know, imported from China, sent it to Amazon warehouse and slowly it picked up, it started selling a lot and I started exploring more products and you know, increase my revenue to almost a million per year with the margin of 10 to 15% which was doing pretty good and it was not sustained. I started exploring again and I reached out a few friends, families, my co-workers back in the hospital and everybody told me real estate is the way to go. And like you mentioned, we were talking before, you know, most of the millionaires are born from the real estate. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the fact. Yeah. But it's not like you can be real estate tomorrow or after investing, it takes time to build the wealth. Yes. And that day I realized, you know, having a money, becoming a rich and owning a property, becoming a wealthy is really different. Yeah, yeah. So that really changed my perspective and I entered to real estate. Yeah, um, I will say one of the things, one of the conversations that I have really commonly with people, especially people that I meet from, say, uh, they listen to the Bigger Pockets podcast and maybe they feel stuck in their life and they want to make a change. Maybe they've had some entrepreneurial dreams, <laughs> right? <laughs> Feelings uh, that they wanted to try to test out. And uh, they want to get started investing, but they don't have the cash or the income necessarily yet, um, which is sort of where I was actually a couple of years ago, right? I had my own business. I had never worked for anyone other than myself or my father when I was younger. And I wanted to, sh I had to shift into a new industry. I picked real estate uh, because I knew that there was so much upside there. And uh, in order to become a real estate investor, I decided to get a job in the industry, right? I decided to become a realtor, join a team, learn the skills while I'm making the money. But there was uh, something scary about that, right? Now it's less scary for me because I'd already been on my own uh, as, as a, you know, I, I knew that I had to make it work. I had to, it, it's a job where you have to go out and hunt and kill every day, otherwise you don't eat, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. 
uh, statistically, 87% of people who uh, get into the realtor business are out <laughs> of the realtor business shortly thereafter, yeah. right? Because it's difficult. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a job that requires staying power. It takes a special kind of person to want to do this, DK. Why the heck? <laughs> Are you going from Amazon FBA uh, and now exploring more real estate? What would make you decide to do something uh, like this? I think you already answered my question saying that you were trying to be an investor and the safest way to jump is being an agent. That's right. <laughs> so for me, you just have to reverse that process. So what I was doing before, after Amazon FBA, I started investing money on real estate buying few rentals, not so many, and doing fix and flips. And from there, we started doing new construction. It's all out of state. You know, we screen contractors, property managers, and we manage them real time. We have a, we have a process to see their progress, you know, manage them. And it, it sounds very, you know, intimidating that it is, it is, wow, fix and flipping, new construction, but there are a lot of works. So, Later on, I realized that, you know, having a good network, you know, so, somebody in the office told me, your network is your net worth. I believe it's true. This is why it, it, yeah, I, I, read, I reached out Rob through Greed, and I thought, you know, it's a good idea to be an agent and connect with other people so that I can be a problem solver with other investors. Same time, I can extend my network. So all you need is a good one deal to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, one of the first decisions that I think most people have to make after they get their real estate license, if they decide to go this route of, they want to eventually become the real estate investor, but on the way there, they need to fix their income problem mm -hmm. and, and their experience problem, right? They want to fix yeah. both those problems. And one way to do that is just to be a realtor for a little while. Um, one of the first decisions that a person who's taking that path would have to decide is, I'm going to be solo versus I'm going to be on a team. So what what went through your mind when you were deciding which path to take? Yeah, that, that is a good question. And for me, the journey is uh, something like I will learn more and make less now rather than, you know, gain all the knowledge, skill, and go for hunting itself, like hunting for deals, hunting for connection. It will shorten my time eventually. So I, th I think it's a better idea keep patience and start focusing on building a network mm -hmm. that will eventually mm -hmm. increase your business i see so so kind of what you're saying is um you're saying shortcutting the amount of time it's going to take you to get up and running for you is more valuable right so your yeah. time mm -hmm. you're trading is more valuable than the uh cut of the pie necessarily on each yeah. deal that you do also i think real estate is one of the industry where people are willing to help each other because if you help somebody, then eventually they will help you in some other ways. Mm -hmm. If not, you'll have a good network. And over here, it's all about referrals. Yes. So if I need a good contractor, if I get referred for someone, eventually I'll get a good quote. Yeah. Because of that contacts and network. So I'm focusing here on network so much because I think it is, it is very valuable in real estate itself, not just as an investor or you know new construction, as business and selling and buying houses or investing houses too, yeah. it will help. Referrals are one of the major yeah. component in real estate. For sure. You know, one of the things that you're making me think of is um, when we're looking at that 87% flunk out rate mm -hmm. for people that are trying to become realtors, I think what a large part of that is, is people are so used to having one hat that they wear, right? I go to my job, my mm -hmm. W-2 mm -hmm. corporate job, I know exactly what's expected of me, and I only have to do that. But if you become a realtor, you become a business owner overnight, and you're responsible for everything. You gotta do the sales, you gotta do the marketing, you gotta know the books, you gotta do the everything. Yeah. <laughs> right? And um, that's hard. I think that is the big barrier to entry for most people trying to become a high net worth salesperson in real estate or even just to survive. I don't think you had that problem. <laughs> yeah, because I also want to add like, um, because of the entrepreneurial skill I had before jumping to real estate, I'm ready for the failure. So the 87% who fails in real estate is it beginning of the year or 
throughout their journey. It, it's uh, within five years of starting, they, yeah. they switch and leave the industry. Um, there, are, there are a few necessities of people. There are, you know, it might be their bread and butter. Mm -hmm. So if it is a bread and butter, if they are not making any progress, if they are failing, it's something wrong with them itself or the network they are generating, the leads they are having. Yeah. But for me, the failure is part of my process. So if I fail, then I will try to rebound as much as harder as I can. So that, that, well, that will be my traits. Yeah, I think part of what I'm suggesting is I think you're already starting off at a, in a better spot than most people, right? Because you've had some business entrepreneurship experience, right? And anyone who has that, has an understanding of what they're getting into, <laughs> yeah. right? Whereas a lot of people don't, and they get blindsided by it. Like, what do you mean I have to pay taxes quarterly? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm mm -hmm. used to that coming out of my check. <laughs> yeah, how? What do you? you know, that alone can sink some people yeah. when if they fail to take account of it as they go, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so DK, uh, as you're thinking about the intersection of real estate and entrepreneurship. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who's thinking about doing this? So real estate, if you want to jump into the real estate, you sure. don't basically, be, you don't have to become an agent itself. Mm -hmm. You need to find some agent who can understand more getting deals, running numbers, and seeing the vision itself. Mm -hmm. So it's an, you, you cannot find a good deal. Sometimes you have to make a good deal itself. So for example, if there is a property listed for 500,000 and it's worth 450, then a lot of agents or a lot of end customers might think it's much more price, price higher and they don't want to reach out or negotiate with the listing agent or the seller itself. Mm -hmm. So if a good real estate agent who can understand the value of the property and thinks what the market really is can go and have the power of negotiation with the seller itself. Yeah, yeah. So I'm hearing a couple things that you're mentioning there. One of the things that you mentioned was getting someone who knows what they're doing on your side, on yeah. your team, right? Yeah. That was the first thing I looked for when I when I switched industries into this. Mm -hmm. I interviewed a couple different teams, and uh, what I liked about um, the guy I ended up working most closely with, Matt Magel, is that. As I hit the ground running, he he would bring me in on some of the deals he was working, so that I could watch him do it. You know, just be his shadow. And then when I had to do something, it would be like I'm on the phone with the other agent, and then I call Matt, and then I call my client, and then I call Matt, and then I call the other agent, and then I call Matt, and I'm just going back and forth with him every time to make sure that he's able to kind of coach me on, okay, what do I do now? Because there's going to be so many of those moments where it's like, what do I do now? Yeah. Right, and you need to have a good network of people to ask. Yeah, and this is why I mentioned earlier too. So net network will help you succeed in most most of the business. It's all about networking. If you are, even if you are selling something on Amazon or eBay or your own website, yeah, if you have a good network, you can get a good product. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me what you think about this. One of the things that I think uh, is the difference between people who stay in the industry and people who don't is that. Um, the people who don't, they don't understand how many hats they're they're really wearing, and so mm -hmm. because of that, they just don't wear them, <laughs> yeah. right? They they just let that part go, and I think what happens with successful business owners is they realize they want to be in the owner position, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily any of the worker positions, right? They're going to hire that out and leverage it out, and there's somebody else who can handle this piece or this piece, right? Because I can only have so many hours in the day that I'm working, mm -hmm. right? And learning how to get that leverage is a big deal. What do you let go of first? What do you let go of second? Yeah. You know, what is the highest dollar per activity, uh, uh, dollar per minute activity that I need to hold on to for the longest time? Right. Just using Elise and I as an example, she kind of handles more the marketing side. I kind of handle more the sales side, knowing our strengths and how we can uh, best leverage uh, each other's talents as as we together grow our business. So, um, for you, what do you think? is the dollar per hour activities that you like to focus on, right? What are you gonna try to hold on to the longest as you leverage things out? For me, I mentioned earlier, I'm new into the real estate agent thing. So for me, I don't have a metrics right now. Mm -hmm. So the getting, getting network is one of the dollar per average adding to my value, but something I always believe all I need is one deal, one deal, one deal. Yeah. So I'm trying to find that one deal that will pay off my 
all the time, effort, and my work, work power, yeah. attitude at one deal. So lead generation. Lead generation and quality one. Yeah, so that's so, number one for you right now. And then and you're kind of, if, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like your number one activity is the lead gen. I got to go yeah. get the business. Yes. And then what you're leveraging out is, okay, I've got it. And now I need Ali or someone mm -hmm. else like, like, okay, help me get through this. Yes. And yes. Uh, that way I can learn how to handle these different Yeah, this is this is, this is this is part of the good team too. So this is why I'm with the Kaza Group because they have the quality team. They understand business. Mm -hmm. They understand the real estate itself, which is much more helpful for me. And you're talking about dollar per average. It doesn't even matter right now. <laughs> whatever I do, whatever I make, mm -hmm. the foundation I lay now, I'll build out the structure later. Yeah, yeah. And that's a good big point, right? A lot of people, when they're looking at, say, an amortization schedule on um, paying down their loan when they buy their first house, right? Man, those first couple payments hurt because you're putting like next to nothing down on the principal yeah. and almost all of its interest. But if you're just patient, right? If yeah. you can just wait those 10 years, right? You're making a lot of money in your sleep. Right, as things start, time works in your favor when you're the one who holds the asset, right? Especially in a in a in a country like the United States where there's so much inflation. <laughs> <laughs> I think the inflation. I think we don't have so much inflation in the U.S. They try to put it under a cap from zero to two percent. Well, they're trying. They haven't they're done trying. that the last yeah. couple of years. <laughs> it's all the pandemic itself mm -hmm. and a lot of things happening in the world. Yeah. And the U.S. has so many business out, outside of the U.S. to handle. So there, there, are, there are a number of factors. Yeah, yeah that for put, sure. Put, put having, under pressure. For sure, having the petrodollar as the reserve currency of most of the countries in the world kind of limits how much we feel the inflation here at home. But um, okay, so DK, tell me a little bit about what you're trying to accomplish in the next year or two, right? Because you seem very much like an entrepreneur at heart. You've definitely been building businesses. Um, what kind of business are you looking to build in the next year or two? That is a very fact, big question for me. So starting off right now, I am trying to connect more in many fields of business, starting from short-term rental, mid-term rental, obviously long-term rental is obviously our thing. It's a generational activity in the real estate, buying, renting mm -hmm. out. I am trying to get into a capital ventures business too, mm -hmm. where I can be a journal partner mm -hmm. raising funds with the accredited investors. Yeah. So it came through my network too. And all the day I was talking to one of the guy in Chicago. I made up through a meetup event mm -hmm. and he was telling me something that um, I told him I'm raising some funds for South Carolina deal. And he had an idea with that deal that in South Carolina, they have mills. Mm -hmm. Used to be a cotton mills. Mm -hmm. And um, what does the government does is they give you tax credit, mm -hmm. and they will lock your property taxes for 30 years. Yeah. And you go there, take that mill over. So what they do is buy that mill, put down the money, raise funds, remodel for living facility, market rent, and they get cash out refinance on the property. Yeah. And the value goes up. You know, it operates for more, but mm -hmm. the tax rate remains for 30 years. Yeah. So it's all about finding, like, just tell people, like, what you are doing. The deal will come along. And like you mentioned, you know, just lay the foundation right now. Yeah. And everything will be all right. So I want to challenge you a little bit here because I'm hearing w some things that I like. It sounds like you're putting yourself in a lot of different rooms to learn a lot of different contexts, kind of getting the lay of the land. But I'm also worried that maybe you're going to have a little bit of a, a problem that so many people have, which mm -hmm. is the shiny object syndrome, because yeah. you've mentioned long, medium, short term. Mm -hmm. You mentioned construction, fix and flips. Yeah. You mentioned now this, this thing with the... Uh, what is the one focus that you think the majority of your growth is going to come from in this coming year and no one can predict but Th this if you is had to pick one this is why i mentioned i'm trying out so many things yeah if i get good into one or two things mm -hmm. that will be my 100% focus mm -hmm. so it's not like you know i have to chase for the deals Deal deals will come on if okay. i do something better mm -hmm. so this is a stage where i have to reach out you know find explore and whatever works for me will be my main passion 
Gotcha. So I, I don't want to distract me with like 10, 12 different work. I, I can handle this very easily mm -hmm. because I'm just starting. I do feel like entrepreneurs do have that uh, belief in themselves. So they're like, oh yeah, I can handle it all. Yeah. No, I, I'm gonna handle this and this. They're both good, I'm just gonna push both, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you ever feel like maybe that's gonna be chasing two rabbits and catching neither one of them? Um, it, it could be. But I always have a backup plan. If not, I'll go with traditional route or Hiya. traditional selling. But also, I I was thinking when I was driving here in the morning mm -hmm. that um, you know making money is something like you know we are just made to do that. Mm -hmm. It's so capitalized over here. Like you know we have to work, make money, mm -hmm. and feed ourselves, and our lifestyle goes up. So mm -hmm. we have to chase our make our dream higher. Mm -hmm. Step up, make more money, and then mm -hmm. you know, it's gonna step up. We have to buy a better car, better house, bigger house. So suddenly, what happens is our necessity all increases. Mm -hmm. So we have to fulfill that demand, and we have to do something better, better, better mm -hmm. every day. And there are some part of the world, like in particularly, I'm origin from Nepal. Mm -hmm. So in Nepal, they never have access in some of some part. They never mm -hmm. have access to internet, no electricity, water. But if you go visit them, they will be the happiest one because their level has not increased yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe if they if you give them phone and TikTok. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'll change, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, they'll be like, oh, all day. Yeah, this is the thing now. Yeah. I'm, I'm leveling up. The envy economy, right? Yes. Always keeping up with the Joneses, right? Nothing's ever good enough. For that. that lifestyle creep can definitely be a problem for a lot of people. Do you do you find that you're experiencing that yourself, or are you pretty yes. pretty disciplined about managing your expenses? No, no, I am experiencing the same thing, <laughs> but I have like taking a step backwards and then thinking like, really, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I deserve this. Yeah, it, it's interesting you bring that up. Elise and I are trying to acquire more real estate this year and we had to make a judgment call on what we're gonna do and we're still not 100% sure um, because we have to decide between a property that's gonna cost us 1500 a month or one that's gonna cost us 3000 a month and it's we can afford either one but it's hard to know what, cause, because one of them Obviously, a $3,000 a month one has a way better chance of appreciating, Yeah. right? But the other one is is going to make it so much easier for us to continue acquiring properties into the future, mm -hmm. right? Because less of a personal expense, right, while still making those acquisitions. So I'm kind of curious what your opinion would be if you were faced with that option, one that's going to be more expensive up front but mm -hmm. may have a better appreciation yeah. versus one that will be a lot easier to cash flow, so mm -hmm. moving out of it sooner will be easier. I if if I were you, so let let me guess if I'm wrong or right. So is it a, one is a townhome and another is a single family? No, no, they're no. both they're both, both the same structure. They're just in different locations. Different location. So I'll probably jump on with the three thousand one. So like I mentioned, taking a step back, mm -hmm. you were thinking, what should I really do? Mm -hmm. So um, all, let let me bring up you an example. I found an investor, and investor told me here in Virginia, you know, there's no cash flow. Mm -hmm. And then I asked the investor, like, where is the cash flow? There's a cash flow in Midwest. You know, we have a property in Columbus, Ohio, too. And it's on, already on the, on the, in the market, and we got an offer within, like, five hours. Mm -hmm. So it's asking overprice, mm -hmm. asking over $100, but it's still asking overprice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked him, like, where, where do you cash flow? He said, Midwest. How mm -hmm. much? $500. This is, this is a rough calculation because yeah, the interest, sure, sure. interest yeah, has yeah. gone up. Yeah. So I don't think anyone's going to be checking you. <laughs> no, no. But five hundred dollars is the average cash flow if you make if you buy like two hundred, three hundred thousand property in Midwest. But what happens is like I asked him like for five years, how much cash flow will you make? Mm. How much is that? It's thirty thousand. Mm -hmm. If you buy in Virginia, anywhere in Virginia, northern, especially northern Virginia, yeah. you can go to Stafford, Triangle, that area. You can buy similar property, but you won't be making cash flow. But look at the amount of appreciation you'll get. Yeah. So I'll I'll chase with the appreciation. Yeah, appreciation one would be your yeah. Route. I I yeah. recently did, we did the same thing too. We yeah. bought a, a house um, last year, thinking you know it's all about this is our cash bank. Yeah. Let's deposit some money every month. Yeah. Hopefully it will appreciate more if everything goes exactly like we planned see, or the economy. See, this is why he's an entrepreneur is because he is thinking. And his, how do, how do I say this? 
The reason why I would say you think like an entrepreneur is because you're not focused on just, okay, what's the cheapest thing I can get? You're thinking, if I compare the two five years, 10 years, 20 years out, you know, I'm willing to take risks that a lot of people won't take, right? I'm willing to bet on the one that's going to have more appreciation um, because the upside is so great. And a lot of people aren't willing to take those risks. They'll take the safe job. They'll take yeah. the nine to five. They'll take the, I'm going to make $15 an hour at McDonald's because that's, that's, they're not willing to risk maybe having a, a negative outcome in a, in a short term. It's a lot of reasons why people don't invest in the stock market either. Yeah. <laughs> they can't, t they can't stomach seeing it go down, even though that just means it's on sale and you should buy more. <laughs> yeah. You, you brought up a stock market. Um, stock market is actually right now it's down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was down like a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So since then, what happened is um, I was down too. I started dollar costing mm -hmm. averaging on the stock I was down. And mm -hmm. certainly, you know, it pumps up a little bit. I started trading, trading, trading. Mm -hmm. Now I have a habit like every 30 minutes in the morning, I have to trade stock. <laughs> <laughs> you got to trade for a few minutes. Yeah. So it'll, it'll make oh it work gosh. now. So it's yeah. like, you know, seeking that opportunity. So it's not like everybody has to do the same. Yeah. But it helps me being more patient. For example, if it goes down, then I'll be like patient. Okay, it will come up. Yeah. I have that belief that it will eventually come up. Yeah. And I can take some risk too because I'm ready to lose whatever I gained. Yeah. So that yeah. that will be a, one of the most valuable thing. I feel like what people fail to understand is they fail to correctly calculate the risk of not trying. Right? Because yeah. you can't escape risk, right? Here's how risky life is. You're not getting out of it alive, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, like mm -hmm. you, you may as well give it a go. And yeah. I feel like that's something that you're comfortable with. You understand that you, success and failure are two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And in order to play the game, you have to actually flip the coin. Sometimes it'll be down, sometimes it'll be up, but the only ones who really make it to a, to a significant level of success are the ones who actually can play the game. And a lot of people just are not calculating the cost of not playing the game, right? You can't really win if you don't shoot the basket. <laughs> yeah. And also, if you start chasing, you mentioned shiny objects, mm -hmm. and listening to so many podcasts, getting so much information, you mentioned bigger pockets. I have, I have listened to each and every podcast. Mm -hmm. You won't believe me. I've listened... That's Listen, a lot of listening hours. Over, Are you on 2x? Over, <laughs> over 500. No, not 2x. S single speed. Yeah. But on the background, if I'm doing some other work, mm -hmm. then I'll be listening to that. And if it is interesting, then I'll come to my iPad or my phone mm -hmm. and then reverse it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and Listen then, to listening back. back there. Yeah. And then if it, it is information, then I'll note it down mm -hmm. so that, I, you know, it, it's not going to help me. And it hasn't helped me so much, but yeah. it has helped me to get the motivation. Like, if he can do it, then I think I can do the same thing. Yeah get more knowledge, get more education, but in the same time, if you are not a risk taker, then find a mentor. Yeah. It's find, so, like find someone you can trust. Find someone who ha already had succeed, succeed on that process, then it will yeah. help you a lot. Yeah, I, lo I love it when the books that I read say something like, step one, do blah, blah, blah. Step yeah. two, if you haven't done step one yet, close this book and give it away because you're clearly not going to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and I love that sentiment. It's like, the, the knowledge is great. I'm all for education. Mm -hmm. But without action, without labor, nothing changes. You must actually take that knowledge and apply it. Yeah. Also, yeah. if you gain so many knowledge, then it's um, too much knowledge over overflow. Mm -hmm. Then you started, you know, you will start thinking like you know you are expert on something, which you have in on theoretically you are very experienced, but practically mm -hmm. you don't have any right risk taking experience or you are not on the field. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. All right. Well, DK, that's about our time. Is there anything, uh, if for anyone out there who wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? The best way will be my phone number, my text. Okay. I do have one Virginia number, especially dedicated to the business. Yeah. So if somebody calls me, texts me, it's only for the business. Okay. So it's 571 602 That is the best way. From there, we can exchange our Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook, whatever. Absolutely. Or so even share businesses, or gain knowledge, help each other, 
everything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I know that if I was listening to this podcast and I heard you, probably what I would want to do is get in touch and be like, hey, those rooms that you're in where you're learning all these different things and mm-hmm. gathering all this context to kind of figure out what you might want to do, could I come join you and be in those rooms with you? <laughs> right? Also, I've, I'll add up, like, I gave out my phone number. Mm-hmm. You know, this is something I measured throughout the process. Like, I started taking people's um, card phone number noting down on a piece of paper or writing on the phone. Yeah. If I start texting them right away, then I'll build that connection that, okay, we'll pass text around Absolutely. and we'll be in touch rather than tossing the card somewhere in the background yeah. and never thinking. Yeah, that's, there's no point, right? So, so save this, like it, and definitely reach out to DK. DK, my friend, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dan. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Time flew really quickly.